Constable of Gwent Police, lovely to see you all online this evening. Looking forward to the engagement and the questions. Um, and of course, lovely to see all the schools and also um, young persons, um, you know, youth clubs and the like joining us today. So that's wonderful. So looking forward to hearing from you all. And of course, keep those questions nice and easy for me, please. Uh, no, genuinely ask whatever questions you'd like, because this is a really important opportunity. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here and engaging with you all. So thank you. I'm happy to go next. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Kelly Harris, uh, pronouns are, and I work for a charity called Brook, uh, which is a sexual health, wellbeing and relationships charity. And we work across the UK and um, we've been working in Wales where we work in schools and youth organisations um, to provide sexual health information, um, relationship information and wellbeing information, which is really important and um, particularly in line with the changes that's been made to the curriculum in Wales around relationships and sexuality education. So delighted to be here um, and look forward to your questions. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Becky and I'm from the Aniron Bevan Health Board. Um, and my role is to support some mental health services in the health board. Um, so I do lots of different things. Um, really nice to see you all this evening. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, what questions you have to ask. Um, so please just keep them coming. I'll go next if that's OK. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Kavita Pasaduru. I'm a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist working in Enirin Bevan University Health Board. I'm also the assistant divisional director for family and therapies. So I oversee a lot of community services that are working in the health board. Uh, I'm passionate about the work that I do, and my interest is engaging with young people understanding what's going well and also listening to them in terms of what could be done better. So I very much am here to hear, um, I'm here to engage with you more actively in a non-clinical workshop basis because most of my engagement is in clinics as well. So excited about networking with fellow panelists and excited to uh, join the young people here. Thanks. Hello everyone, I think that's me as the last to go. Um, I'm Rachel Evans, I'm a clinical psychologist. I work in the child and family psychology um, and therapies department, um, which is based at St. Caddick's Hospital. Um, we've got a lot of different um, teams that psychologists work into. Um, my role is in the um, child and family community psychology team. Um, and I'm working a little bit uh, one day a week with um, a police team called Operation Quartz. Um, so yeah, really happy to be here and privileged to be part of the conversation. Right, fabulous. I think that, I'm oh, sorry, we've got a bit of background noise going on. <laughs> um, it's fabulous everyone to see you guys here tonight. Um, I'm Eva, by the way, I'm co-hosting with Brandon tonight. Um, we've had some questions sent in uh, beforehand. Um, I'm just going to pass on to Hugh Clements, part of the Cofinity Forum, to ask his question to start us off this evening. Hello. <clears throat> Let me look at the final question I sent. Let me look very quickly. Uh, is there a question? Just forget. What type of job is your favourite within the police? So whoever wants to pick up that question first. Yeah, uh, it's, it's first Kelly. Yeah. Do you, do you want to answer first, Kelly? Yeah, what I would say is I don't Sorry. actually work. For, no, it's OK. I, I don't actually work for the police. So in terms of what would be my favourite job within the police. Um, however, I am very always really impressed the amount of training and professional training that police officers have in relation to working with young people. Um, and always very thankful for having the police. Um, but yeah, sorry, I can't answer that one because I don't work there. So apologies. Anybody everyone. else or any other person? 
Yes, I can come in there if that's OK, Hugh. Yep. Great. Well, I'm Pam Kelly, as I've already said, and I'm the Chief Constable of Gwent Police, which means that I have been um, a police officer for nearly 28 years. Um, and ultimately, um, I've been a, a police constable, I've been a detective, and of course, throughout my service, um, I've gone through, if you like, the supervisory ranks, being a sergeant, inspector, chief inspector, and the like. And, and I think I've got the, the, the biggest privilege of leading a fantastic organisation uh, of people who save life every day um, and who make a difference in communities every day, trying to keep people safe. So I think I've got the job, which is perhaps the best privilege. But I think the job that I enjoyed most in policing uh, was being a detective. And some of you might like watching detective programmes on the television. Uh, being a real life detective is much better than that. It's much more interesting because it is very much about piecing together the evidence, the clues in order to make sure that first of all, we find out who's committed crime, but ultimately through detecting crime, we're able to keep people safe. And as a detective, what that, I, what that meant was that I was dealing with the most serious of crime. Uh, and when you're able to detect and make sure you find out who the people are that have hurt people in our communities, and you're able to bring about justice, that's the biggest responsibility and the best job. So the biggest privilege is being the chief constable, but the job I enjoyed most was being a detective. And I hope that answers a little bit uh, in terms of your question. Thanks so much. If, if I could uh, just, uh, if, if I could just come in as as well, uh, Jack up here. I, I'm not a police officer. The commissioner is quite separate. Um, I'm uh, an elected uh, uh, commissioner, so I'm a politician, um, and I've been uh, the commissioner for coming up for six years now, and it's been a wonderful experience. Um, and policing is a very, very important public service for the reasons that Pam has just uh, outlined. Uh, it's very much about keeping people safe and avoiding crime, if that's at all possible. But where crime does happen, making sure that we do our very best to catch the perpetrators, whatever that crime may be, and that may vary from the most extreme crime, murder, uh, down to antisocial behaviour, uh, which blights our communities and, and all points uh, in between. For me, um, the main essence of my job is, is to hold policing to account for the work that they do in Gwent. Um, and uh, the best part of it is actually, in my opinion, meeting people, especially young people, on forums like this. Uh, because that, you know, we live in a democracy and it's only right and proper that people like us are, are held to account uh, and ask um, or rather seek to answer your questions. Uh, so this is the best bit for me. Thank you all for your responses. I'm going to pass over to Brendan now to ask the next question. And by the way, guys, if you have any questions about the event, don't be shy to put them in chat. Okay, sorry about that. A bit of technical difficulties. You can tell we're not very good at it still after no, all this time. No, we are not. We are not at all. Um, well, you can see me on my computer, but you'll hear me on Ava's computer. It doesn't yeah, matter. Anywho. Um, so the next question is from the Caffini Police Cadet Unit. <coughs> oh, a bit louder. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the next question is from the Caffini Police Cadet Unit. Um, so they want to, to know, is enough being done uh, to inform young people around what is a hate crime and knowing their rights as a young person? Um, so can we maybe ask, um, 
Do you want, Jeff, do you want to kick off this? <laughs> I'll start willingly, and I'm sure the Pam and others will want to come in. In fact, this morning I attended a meeting of the Independent Advisory Group, uh, which is a group that we set up uh, in partnership with, with Gwent Police, uh, whose job it is to make sure that the police and my office are aware of what's going on in the communities, in the mixed communities, whether they're from different ethnic groups or uh, groups of people with what we call protected characteristics, maybe to do with sexual orientation or disability, a range of issues like that. Uh, and we had quite a discussion on the issue of hate crime and why it's so important for people to report hate crime to us uh, so that we can try and deal with it because it can be a very, very distressing type of crime. Uh, people can be deeply offended, deeply hurt by some of the things that are said and done to them. In particular, we were talking about transgender uh, hate crime uh, and how people sometimes feel reluctant to pass on information to the police. Uh, but of course, if, we, if we're if we not told about things, we can't really do much about it. So it is very important that they or others on their behalf try and pass information to us. We do talk to young people in particular, uh, especially through our school's liaison service, uh, about the dangers of hate crime and what to do if anybody uh, feels that they are being abused uh, and believe it could be hate crime. So it's something that we take very, very seriously indeed. Okay, thank you very much for your answer, Jeff. Does anyone else want to answer this question as well? Right, Pam, do you want to answer first? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, very much. Um, a really good question because, first of all, the fact that that question's come from um, Kafili Cadet Unit uh, is really good because I'm very grateful to our police cadets who are volunteers and are a part of the Gwent police family. So if any of you wish to become a police cadet and or eventually a special constable, which is also a volunteer that comes and works alongside regular officers uh, when people are above the age of 18, but a, but a police cadet can come and help us younger than 18. Um, so it's really important that we seek the views of young people and our cadets are always telling us what we need to do differently. So uh, first of all, hate crime. And at the beginning of this session, we talked about respect and respect is so, so important in our society. And what makes hate crime um, really important is that usually it is crime and that may be physical assault, it might be targeting, it might be verbal uh, on people who clearly might be disabled, who might be struggling with mental health issues, who might be from a different ethnic background, who might be from a different faith. And in my view, that is totally, totally unacceptable. And at the moment in Parliament, there's a conversation around misogyny, which is a word you might have he heard, which is where people are actually um, showing hate towards women in particular. And there's a conversation as to whether misogyny should become a hate crime. The reality is, if we have a respect agenda and if people, people are not respectful and targeting people, then that needs to be reported. And when a hate crime is reported, what we do is make sure that we have specialist officers who can support those individuals who might feel uncomfortable about reporting crime. So we're doing our best to make sure we serve the public by giving people the right uh, resource, the right skills to serve people who want to report hate crime. What I want to know is is that message landing with young people so and and in all honesty is there more that we can do yes but also i want to listen to how we can do that better so we have schools uh, liaison officers going into schools they are a part of gwent police and they they are going in talking about relationships talking about society and wanting young people to tell us what we need to do differently my answer to you is do not accept hate crime. You're the future generations. You're the people that are going to make a difference. And if you see hate crime happening, 
Don't be a bystander. Tell a teacher, tell a member, an adult, so that they can report on your behalf or with you. And what I will say is Gwent Police will always do their best, always do their best uh, to support people who report crime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, to, I'm going to pass over to Brendan. Sorry, we're on the same screen now because technical difficulties yeah, aren't. It just makes life easier, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. Don't you just love technology? Um, anyway, I was going to go on to a question from Kapili Forum about um, mental health, and um, what they have asked is, um, how has COVID nineteen, the pandemic, affected people's mental health, and how is it, more importantly, I would say, affected mental health services? Sorry, perhaps if I come in with who maybe want to answer that. Uh, um, Kapitha wants, yeah. you want to yeah. answer this? Yeah. Please put your hand up. <laughs> Sorry, you muted. <laughs> Sorry, my mute unmute button was playing up. Um, so yeah, going to the first part of the question, COVID-19 impact on mental health, particularly for young people. I know we all have been pushed with no warning into the deep end with COVID-19 pandemic. Before we knew it was coming, it was there, and it has had a significant impact on our day-to-day -day lifestyle, what we have been through as very much uh, taken for granted as normal. We have all been uh, had have to go through a huge level of adjustment to what was completely new to us. We never had to go through things like lockdown, having to have uh, face masks at all times, cutting off with all our social groups, connections, distancing from families. And some of us have had um, really difficult experiences of um, loss and um, some significant traumatic events too that we have heard um, over as well. So COVID-19 generally has had a major impact, particularly for, for children and young people. The, the, the main things that I would like to discuss are mainly around that adjustment of not having structure for the day, school routine and having to live with the uncertainty of what's coming. We were not sure. Guidelines were changing very quickly. So we always had to be very quick in our um, ability to adapt to something new all the time while facing uncertainties um, that were ahead of us. That is hugely stressful for anyone, but more so for children and young people, and particularly for some young people where they may already have some vulnerabilities in terms of their um, development, their family situation, their upbringing. So they may already have some vulnerable factors that might have affected them and any change in their normal routine or lifestyle would have had a huge impact. So that ha having said that, um, I'll briefly touch on the impact on services and then probably my colleagues will chip in. So we were ahead of the game in terms of predicting that things will not be easy during or post pandemic. So one of the things we made sure was to not shut down any service, um, but to quickly adapt technology to make sure that we still are accessible to support children and young people. The way we have done that was through uh, digital technology. We had Attend Anywhere, which really helped us on providing remote consultations, remote um, appointments, virtual appointments, where we learned that some young people struggled to come to clinics and they preferred this irrespective of the pandemic. So we had to um, switch on into young people's mode and become more tech savvy with um, using technology and um, uh, they are a lot quicker than we are in qu very quickly um, using technology to get on to appointments. So that has helped. However, there is uh, still quite a huge amount of work that needs to be done because of the impact of people having to adjust to the new normal again, having periods of um, not having to go to school, being in their comfort bubble, school-based anxieties have increased quite a lot on people having to go back to school and having missed some of those 
social connections, the networking, the friendships, the usual chit chats or having those conversations in the backyard. All the things that are really important for physical and mental well-being have been impacted. So what well-being is one aspect to the, the other end of the spectrum is how unwell people can become because of lack of that support. So we have seen an increase in the number of um, uh, young people that are referred to services. However, the, the help that we have had with the use of di digital technology meant that uh, we are not in a stop and restart uh, situation. We are just catching up um, as always. So uh, I will let my colleagues um, chip in if that's OK. Thank you, Kavitha. Um, Chair, am I OK to come in? You certainly yeah. are. That's absolutely fine. Super. Thank you very much. Um, it was just an additional thing, really. Kavitha's obviously covered that incredibly well, so I don't need to add too much. Um, but I wanted just to say, you know, from my experience of talking um, with some of your groups anyway, um, just to kind of really reiterate that COVID-19 has kind of impacted everybody. So don't feel like you're alone in your feelings um, and that your feelings are really valid no matter what they are. And even if they're different to your friends, your mum, your dad, your siblings, whoever, um, just remember that they're valid to you. Um, and also the other thing to remember is that things might hit you at different times. So things might impact you very later on and it might not feel that you've quite had the impact of COVID just yet. Um, but again, that's that goes back to that. Everyone's different in how they feel and how it impacts them at different times. Um, so, you know, just really kind of to hold that in mind and to remember to keep talking about these things. So even if you might feel a bit silly saying, oh, well, now I feel the impact of that. Don't don't feel silly and just just say it just keep talking about it to whoever you feel most comfortable you know we're talking to um and the other thing to say is when you're you know engaging with mental health services whatever that looks like actually it's really important for you to tell us how it's impacted you too and how the services are working for you because we only know what we know from where we're sitting so if you think we are missing something or if you think that it um you know that we don't quite know what you feel like and how it has impacted you please tell us you know if you speak to one of us in any professional setting or even not you know just come forward and share with us what it felt like for you and how that and how we can help you because actually that's better if it comes from you and you explain to us how we can help you best that just wanted to add that thank you rebecca for answering um if we just quickly throw to rachel before you move on Hi, I won't be too much uh, longer because I know there's so many questions, but um, thank you for everybody's questions that are coming in and um, just really, I just wanted to mention the war as well. <laughs> So, you know, what an absolute nightmare uh, it is at the moment and couldn't have believed if you turned on the news sort of five years ago what, what has happened and just how much, like, obviously, how could that not have an impact on us all? And whilst there's some positives to come of it, perhaps, like some people actually have preferred having time away from school or there's been, you know, everybody is different, like has been said, so there's some positives and negatives, but I think just as a, as a whole society, society what everybody's been through and I think what we know is about the widening gap of inequalities so that some people you know it's not a level playing field some people have more be that financial be that support in their environment at home or at school be that you know um, more opportunities and and all of that kind of comes in to determine whether or not um, you know how how easy it is and to kind of weather everything that's gone on um so just yeah i think it's um you know this has affected us all and like becky said in different ways and it come out in different ways so just trying to be kind to ourselves and to each other that this is a really difficult period i think in history that we'll look back on and and be amazed at really oh, that's all i'll say for the sec thank you so much rachel uh fab yeah really good answers thank you um so the next question I wanted to ask, and it's, um, I think it's a very apt one for Kelly to perhaps answer. Um, so what help and support is there for young people to access 
uh, for them to understand a healthy relationship and what isn't a healthy relationship. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. It really, really is. Thank you. Um, so I think really one of the, the best places where people will learn about relationships ultimately kind of comes from their own personal experience, you know, in terms of the family settings that you might grow up in or the care experience settings you might grow up in, your friends, you know. So we learn a lot via um, kind of taking part in things. However, it's not always a positive for people, you know, and some people might grow up, unfortunately, in unhealthy settings. Um, but education has a huge, huge place to play in this. So in terms of from a young age, you know, we we at Brooke think it's really important that young people have education around healthy relationships from primary schools, because sometimes when people think about relationships, they sometimes think romantic relationships. But we have lots of different relationships in our day to day life. So our family, our friends, our police officers, our teachers, youth workers, all of these people that you will see on a day to day basis so it's really really important that people understand from a young age what is a sign of a healthy one um and then things to be able to look out for so education is really important and what in terms of services that are available to people um schools have a duty now under the new curriculum under the new relationship sexuality education which is coming into force this September from 2022 and um, to make sure that this is being taught from primary school age and from infant age all the way up to sixth form so being able to ensure that they're providing education on healthy relationships but outside of that really good places to find information is the organization that I work for and I'll put some links in the chat for you as well um, but Brooke has a fantastic um, uh, website full of really really good useful information about relationships as well as all things Things relating to online safety, sexual health things, all different topics. But there's also some other really good services. So NSPCC have some really good resources as well as Childline. But also here in Wales, we've got a bilingual service called MEIC as well. And um, the helpline, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, uh, M-E-I-C. And it's a dedicated helpline that offers both English and Welsh services for young people. You can text them, you can ring them, you can go on their website. And I will put all of these things in the chat once I finish giving my answer. Um, but they are places you can go to. And also we just say a trusted adult, somebody that you feel that you can talk to, that you can explain things to, to understand what is a healthy relationship and what is not. But anything that upsets you or anything that makes you feel a bit unhappy, we would definitely always recommend speaking to an adult. So I hope that helps. It was a bit of a long answer, but I'll put all of those different things I've mentioned into the chat for everyone to have as well. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's quite insightful, actually, um, coming from someone who um, didn't have a lot of education on healthy relationships. Um, I've been seeing quite a lot of people asking a variation of this question in the chat. So um, can maybe one of the people who work with the police uh, define antisocial behaviour and kind of explain what is done by the police and the police service to kind of combat that in the Gwent area? You want to go first, Jeff, and then myself? No, I'm quite happy for you to go first, Pam. OK, so first of all, thank you very much for the observation in the chat, which said that there'd been reductions in antisocial behaviour uh, in, in some local areas. So antisocial behaviour is, is, is really important because what it is, 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 is basically things that happen in a community that cause fear and concern to others. And that can, can be anything from, um, you know, people shouting at, at individuals in the street, uh, neighbours perhaps that are very noisy. Um, it can be uh, bullying. It can be sometimes perceived as when perhaps people are congregating in one area um, and other members, I'm doing nothing, but other members of the community are fearful because they see a large group of people. So antisocial behaviour is behaviour that causes people concern and is deemed to be something which um, isn't respectful of others. I think that's the simplest way of, of, of explaining that. So what do we need to do first of all and what are we doing as a police service? And then perhaps, you know, what what could young people be mindful of as well? 
because I'm I'm an ambassador for young people. I think you've been fantastic throughout the COVID crisis. I think you've been amazing. You know, two years not being able to go to school at times, not being able to see your friends. And in fact, you know, we have not had huge amounts of antisocial behaviour reported in Gwent. So that's a credit not just, you know, to the way in which many people uh, are behaving. And sometimes you see what happens is you might all go to a park and have a bit of a laugh with your friends. But some people might think that you're up to no good. Uh, and some people might think that perhaps, you know, you're drinking alcohol together or making too much noise. And, you know, you were entitled to enjoy playing in your community. And that's what young people should do. But just be mindful sometimes of perhaps when you're in a group of what that could look and feel like to perhaps an elderly person or somebody who's just trying to pass through that area. So it goes back to that respect agenda. Be kind, say hello, you know, ask people how they are so that they are not concerned um, about perhaps you congregating in an area. Just think about what that might look like for others. And what we do in policing is we, we've got com community support officers that you might you might see in your community. And they patrol those hotspot areas, areas where we know um, uh, communities report antisocial behaviour. So, the, you know, sometimes they're the parks. And let me tell you, it's not young people that always commit antisocial behaviour. It's sometimes older people as well. But what we do is patrol those hotspot areas where we know sometimes antisocial behaviour is reported. We'd rather people be told, and that's what our community support officers do. We explain, we explain what we, we'd like them to do and what, what people are perceiving that behaviour to be. We warn people. We might come along and tell parents or your schools about things that are concerning us. We try and nip a problem in the bud because what I don't want is young people being criminalised for behaviour that perhaps they're not aware of is antisocial. So speaking to young people, explaining some of the concerns by the wider community in particular, and young people recognising what some behaviour is perceived as and where people constantly breach antisocial behaviour and are a real problem in communities, then of course police will take action. So just be mindful of antisocial behaviour. There are some people who are very antisocial and are a real nuisance and we will of course take positive action. But where I'd like to be is that we can have a conversation about it as a community with police officers and community support officers to prevent and reduce antisocial behaviour in the first place. So I'd be grateful for your help on that one because it's something we all need to keep an eye on. Yeah, can I agree very much with what uh, Pam Kelly has just said? Um, one thing I would suggest that all young people do, um, and it's easily obtainable online, is to get hold of the police and crime plan for Gwent because if you do that you'll see what the local priorities for policing in Gwent actually are and one of them is dealing with antisocial behaviour. Uh, and what we try to do as well is, is to prevent it happening in the first place uh, and we run a scheme and you may have heard of it called the Headley Bach, the mini police, which is for Children in primary school in the last uh, two years of primary school, uh, where they will work with local neighbourhood policing teams, particularly the community support officers, uh, to understand uh, about what their community needs and what being a good citizen is all about. Um, and that, we've got no doubt, will help prevent uh, a lot of antisocial behaviour in the future. Uh, as those children become adolescents and then young people. Um, and as the Chief Constable says, um, it's not all about young people. Um, certainly large groups can feel a threat to elder people or people who are vulnerable or maybe disabled. They can, they can seem frightening, especially if there's shouts of abuse or something like that. But very often it is older people who should know a lot better, but maybe playing loud music all the time, um, maybe uh, not bothering to clear up litter after themselves, um, 
not necessarily policing matters, maybe more for the local authority, but nevertheless, the the way in which it impacts upon the community is very important. So partnership working is very important for us indeed, and that involves you as the future citizens uh, of Gwent. So, yep, you need to tell us, you need to be aware of things, uh, and together perhaps we can do something about it. Fab. Thank you for all those answers, everyone, um, from the panelists. Um, so the next question I wanted to bring up is from Megan Powie. Um, she has said, as we, as young people are now coming up to exam season, um, this can obviously be quite a stressful time. I certainly remember it was for me, um, filled with anxiety. So I guess for the mental health professionals in the room or on the meeting, shall we say, um, what would you advise young people do to help them deal with any of their worries? Um, I don't know who wants to start off, perhaps um, if I have a look, <laughs> Rachel, maybe. Yeah, that's fine. I think um, just as you said, Brendan, it's an absolutely horrible experience and it's very unfortunate, in my opinion, that that's how our education system has organised itself to put people through these exams. Um, you know, you'll know you're not alone in feeling stressed and I remember it intensely as well. Um, sleepless nights, how to try and keep a balance. And I think, you know, it's so hard to give advice because everybody's different and you know I think it's you, you know you best but it, you know again everybody said about the importance of having trusted relationships so whether that's you know somebody at home or your friends or school but talking to people and sharing because you know it's not something wrong with you it's something that's happening to you as a result of how our kind of society puts young people through these hurdles um and it's such an intense period and trying to somehow find a way that you can maintain stuff that matters to you outside of the exam process. So, you know, keeping in touch with friends, trying to do nice activities, trying to, you know, remember to do the basics of eating healthy or just eating, you know, trying to make sure you're kind of giving your body the fuel that it needs, trying to get some sleep and have a kind of evening even with all the pressures that you've got trying to unwind um and asking for help um and i think the thing is it's it's with hindsight that it's easy to look back and go god that was hard that was an awful period and it passes but when you're in it it's so much harder to kind of have any perspective and it's you're getting told constantly i think sometimes the messages that are given about the importance of exams you know sometimes they land heaviest on those people that don't need to hear that message so the ones that are trying their best and feeling really really worried um so i just think yeah whatever you can do to try and keep um, normal life going and speaking to people about how hard it is and knowing that you're not alone. Um, they sound simple, but there is really important and it's such a stressful time. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to Becky. I can see her hands up. Thanks, Rachel. Is that OK, Chair, for me to go? Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks, Rach. I think you've covered most of it. I think I was just going to put um, something else in, which is actually what I put on the profile about speaking to my 15 year old self um, and something around kind of not putting too much pressure on yourself, um, because actually, you know, this exams feel really, really big right now and really, really stressful. But when you're an adult, they seem smaller. So don't put too much pressure on yourself because you're already doing the best you possibly can and you're working the best you possibly can already. And you're good enough without putting that extra pressure on yourself. So just remember that little inner voice that tells you you've got to work harder or um, work even more. Um, just sometimes give it a little you know, nudge and t tell it to go away sometimes because actually um, you don't need to put that extra pressure on. Um, and going back to what I said earlier, about keep talking which I think Rachel mentioned as well um, and then just a really kind of random tip from me 
I am a massive Disney fan for those people who know me um, and I find watching a Disney film really really helps because it takes me away from the stresses and strains of everyday life so um, and also there's often kind of songs and stuff you know that um, I can sing along to I find singing and you know singing along to things really helpful for me um so yeah i was just going to suggest really if there's a film that you really really like that helps you feel happy and you can even you can sing along to it as well um i would really encourage that as a bit of reward for all the work that you've done in terms of revision and things and give yourself a little breather watch that film sing along to it if there's a song in it um and just really enjoy the things that bring you some joy and finding that um, time in your day to do that too so yeah absolutely that sorry chair if that's okay i would just like to add one more point to things that have been uh, already covered if that's okay yeah 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 of course yeah, so completely agree with um, Rachel and um, Rebecca. One thing I felt was um, actually to also feel that it is OK to get stressed when things are not easy for you in life and not to feel that there is something wrong with you because a lot of young people go through it. There may be some who are superficially appearing OK and managing well, but maybe struggling within themselves and others may actually show it out there. But it is uh, something that you all can discuss, keep connected, talk to each other and get some validation that every, it, it is really a difficult time. And particularly, particularly at this time, there are young people who are doing exams who haven't done exams in the last couple of years. So people who must have um, skipped doing GCSEs or first year of A-levels are now probably doing second year A-levels. So previous experience of exams may be less so after a gap, if you're having to do, then your stress levels could be more than what they would have been before. So uh, yeah, just we were talking about uh, being kind to each other, but also be kind to yourselves. That's also self-care is absolutely important. Thank you so much, everyone, for your answers. Um, I've seen quite a couple of young people actually put in the chat about knowledge for young people, um, in particular about a stop and search and the rules and um, around that and what rights they kind of have in those kind of situations. So um, maybe um, if Pam wants to start us off on that question. Absolutely, thank you. So yes, yeah, stop and search is is a really contentious law because it's it's we basically have a power to stop and search people in the in the community where we have reasonable grounds. And that, that's important where we have reasonable grounds to suspect that perhaps they may have something with them um, that might cause themselves or others are harm or perhaps that they um, have on them in order to perhaps commit a crime as well. So, of course, and there are some items that people should never carry um, unless they have a lawful excuse, if you like, such as knives, because, of course, it's really important that we keep people safe. Um, but in our community, those police officers then are out and about seeing people, looking at people's behaviour. Um, they're in areas perhaps where there may be some crimes happening and then they consider whether to use those powers or not. But those stop and search powers um, are, are really important for us to be able to keep people safe, but we have to use them properly. OK, so we have to have those reasonable grounds before we stop and search other, others. Uh, and what I have told our officers who undertake stop and search is that they must, they must use their body worn camera whenever they undertake stop and search. OK, so if they are stopping and searching somebody, they must record it. They must record that activity. And what happens is that we then have an independent advisory group that actually dip sample some of those body worn camera images uh, to Chief make Constable. sure. <laughs> Hello. I'm so sorry to interrupt. So, um, what I've decided, or what me and uh, Ava have both decided, just for yeah. um, the purposes of uh, equality and 
being um, fast. <laughs> Swift. We, obviously, we want to get everyone's views and we want it to yeah. be more diverse. Um, so I'm just going to give everyone time. But if you want to finish your last comment, that's yeah, fine. No worries. But to give everyone that update that we're going to be timing people now. So I'm giving them a nice one minute, 30 seconds each. Good. Thank you. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you, my friends. So, yes. So, so basically, my advice is to you, you know, engage with officers. They will only stop and search uh, if there's a need. It's recorded and we check and test it. Good prompt, chairs. Thank you. <laughs> is there anyone else who would like to come in on this issue at all? Okay, I think I've scared them with the time. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, well done. Good sharing. Thank you very much. Um, so the, the, the question that has come up, um, or one that I was going to ask is um, around mental health again. So what mental health support is out there for uh, young people who may be in crisis? Um, you know, is there more we can be doing? Just obviously it would be good to hear your thoughts on that. Um, Anyone want to jump in? Uh, jump in. That's completely fine. Yeah, I, I'll I'll take that. So, from the children and adolescent mental health perspective, so we are a service who look after children and young people up to their 18th birthday. So. When we talk about crisis, then it is someone recognizing or identifying that a child or young person is in crisis. And when, when we say crisis, it is about something that needs an immediate support and immediate help and recognizing that there is a need for help. Uh, we, from the service perspective, we are not there with young people all the time. So you you will be very, very much either with your family, with your friends, or with within a school or education setting, or somewhere uh, outside in a public place. So depending on what you're experiencing, then you may recognize that you need help, or someone next to you may recognize that you need help. Um, the the usual. Uh, health access pathways are through if you need someone from mental health to advise what's the best way to do the first action would be either th through your out of hours GP or accident and emergency because they are the two health front doors that are available 24 7. What we have developed in Gwent uh, in the last couple of years is expanding or um, uh, the availability of our mental health services. So we used to be Monday to Friday, nine to five. Now we have our availability on seven days a week. So there is a, a duty clinician who is available on the duty crisis line. Um, so either the GP or uh, from our uh, accident and emergency colleagues, we can get a call about the young person who may present in crisis. We work very closely with education and um, local authorities as well as police. So if they pick up that things are getting difficult with a young person, they can directly ring our crisis line. For children themselves and young people, if they want extra help, Sorry, am I being timed? I'll be very quick. <laughs> there is um, a child line and there is Samaritans. If they, if you prefer uh, urgent advice via telephone so that there is access to direct help. Um, so sorry for the brief answer. I could talk more, but yeah. Hey, thank you so much. Is there anyone who would like to also answer a question before we move on? No? OK, cool. So um, quite a few people actually have um, come up with specific questions for certain areas about underage drinking um, and drug abuse. But to kind of make sure that we have a broader idea, um, can we maybe have a summary of what actions the police are taking to combat underage drinking and drug abuse? And then if you guys in the on the call right now have specific areas, um, then feel free to find out who your local policing team is so you can have a kind of better understanding. But for now, if we have a kind of broader covering of the Gwent area, so whoever wants to start us off on that. Do you want me to come in quickly? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, time me now then, time me, okay? So, 
Um, basically, visible policing is absolutely the way that we try and deter people from antisocial behaviour and, of course, underage drinking. Um, and, of course, through education with schools as well. So making sure that young people understand um, you know, the impact of substance misuse um, and, you know, and don't go down the wrong path really um, as well. So, so that's what we do when we're being visible, we're trying to improve through education, but ultimately team, what I don't want is young people getting into trouble. So try not to go down that group thinking approach and just join the gang in your community. Don't do that. You don't have to, you know, be a part of any um, gang or group thinking around substance misuse, alcohol, drugs and antisocial behaviour. Be the person that walks away because what we don't want is you getting into trouble. But because we do have visible policing, we have CCTV, we have police cars that go around with cameras uh, and officers use body worn cameras as well. So just be mindful of that, everyone. And if I can just add to that um, on the issue of underage, underage drinking, not only, of course, can it uh, create that feeling of invincibility uh, and therefore lead to bad behaviour because you're not properly in control of yourself, it can also damage your health if it stays and it persists. And those who supply the alcohol, of course, if they're shopkeepers, run the risk of losing their licence to sell alcohol uh, and adults indeed can be prosecuted for providing it to people who are underage. So a lot of people can be hurt with it. The issue of drugs, very important. You'll all be familiar, I dare say, with the expression of county lines, how young people can be drawn into drug dealing, never mind drug taking. Uh, and that, quite frankly, is a disaster because it will lead undoubtedly to detection and jail, uh, and then the lives are blighted for the long term. So say no to drugs is a very important message. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I think Rachel has a comment to say as well. So if we come to you quickly. Yeah, I'll be quick. I was just going to say, um, I think the, the there's so many reasons why people would be drinking or um, taking drugs. And I guess those those reasons could range from because you know they're it's like a party or like a social event or for some people it can be more of a sort of coping mechanism which you know they might have a lot of negatives um behind that but maybe it's meeting some like underlying need or maybe people are stressed and they think that it might help them relax um or, or whatever it may be a bit of an escape but i think um you know it comes back to recognizing when things are becoming difficult and speaking to somebody that you know cares about you um to try and work out to understand what's going on and then you know to work out how best to 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 do other things if that is the case or at least just to understand why you are doing things can make a big difference so if it feels that drugs and alcohol or whatever it may be are becoming a problem or something to um that are stopping you um doing other things you want then just trying to kind of work out what's going on there for you is um, really important. All right, thank you so much everyone who answered that question. Can I ask that question, thank you? Yes, I'm more than happy to answer, ask the next question. <laughs> Would be helpful if I got my English correct first. Um, so in regards to social media, um, do you think it, it has exaggerated um, things? Do you think that it's had a massive impact on young people, their well-being, their mental health? And, um, you know, I, I guess perhaps the question is how do we try and curb that? Uh, Rachel, do you want to go first? Yeah, it's only because it's such a, it really rings um, a bell for me. We did a um, participation group as a service um, to try and understand um, you know, views of young people and how to embed that in service development. And it was such a theme where young people found it so frustrated. The people that we talked to um, found it so frustrating how adults sometimes see social media as a negative thing um, and they would get kind of given blanket like you know talks on risk and social media which they didn't some of these young people didn't find helpful so i think it's that new it's the it's the positives and the negatives of it so i think it probably has an impact on mental health and well-being in both positive and negative directions um and i think in terms of social media again everybody's different in terms of what they 
um, benefit from. But, you know, if, if you're finding that it is actually impacting on you and you think kind of stepping away from whatever platforms it is that you're on is useful, then that's something to try and then evaluate for yourself, really. Um, but it's just it just made me think of echoing those voices of people who wanted to say, no, it's really positive for building relationships as well as potentially has some stress. And, you know, people worry about how they look or how they're coming across um, in that area. Um, so, yeah, just that was my thoughts on that question. Thank you for being so concise as well. Um, I think, Kavitha, as well, do you want to add to that? Yeah, very quickly. I agree. And I just wanted to add, we had um, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists conducted a debate on young people, primary school children, um, about um, is social media good for mental health? And we were quite surprised about the richness of the uh, debate and how there was equal argument. So I think it is difficult to say a clear good or bad, but what, what is we recognizing what is good and when is it stepping into that zone when it can be a risk to something such as cyberbullying and to that high risk areas. Uh, we also have noticed some activity on social media where risk taking behavior became more and more predominant. So that's when recognition is really important that it is uh, quite dangerous. So I think all in all for fun, entertainment and keeping social contact, especially during pandemic when we missed out on those opportunities, social media was good but equally it can be um, it, it can be dangerous if not used in the right uh, context and to the right extent. Thank you so much both for answering. Is there anyone else who wants to answer this question? No? Okay, thank you again. Um, we're going to go back to one of the questions that was submitted before the event from the Cathilia Youth Forum. Um, I know, um, Pam Kelly, you said about how you got involved with policing. Um, uh, how do you hope to get more young people into policing in the future? Okay, thank you. What a great question. So we're already doing an awful lot. As the Commissioner Jeff Cuthbert has said, we're trying to link in with young people at the earliest stage. So our Heatherly Bach, our mini police, they're there with their Gwen police hat, being a part of the policing family, even in primary school. Then as police cadets, really chatting about citizenship, wanting to make sure that young people are a part of, you know, understanding um, things such as violence against women and girls in the community, understanding hate crime, really understanding the importance of citizenship and the role of policing. Uh, and then, of course, um, hopefully people will want to join the police. And I think it's really important. So many of you that are online today care about your community. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking these questions. Uh, and my challenge to you is to follow your dreams in terms of what you want to achieve. But that my dream was initially to be a, a, be a teacher, but I ended up becoming a special constable, a volunteer, whilst I was in college. And I decided that policing was something that I wanted to do. And if you follow your dreams and you follow that passion of wanting to help your community, then policing is definitely something um, that you should consider. It's the best job in the world because you can make a difference. You can make a difference to people's lives every single day just by helping them and by helping your community. And so, you know, for me, asking young people to become a part of policing through Heatherly Bach, police cadets, and through engagements such as this, and asking people who've got really good values and who care about people to, to come and put a uniform on and help us make a difference. So, you know, if you've got that fire in your belly, come and join Gwent Police because we'll be glad to see you. Thank you so much. And I know that we have um, some leaders and even some members here of Police Cadet. So if you want to put in the chat as well um, and ask, um, I think that they put their details in. Um, so if you are interested in becoming a police cadet, um, you can go in the chat there as well. Um, Jeff, have you got anything to add to that? Well, thanks very much. Uh, no, I, I quite agree. Look, um, I, I we know that there's been stuff in the press 
uh, about individual police officers who behave very poorly. Um, there's no doubt about that, and we, we don't try and pretend otherwise. But the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of police officers want to help their communities. They want to be supportive of individuals, particularly very ind uh, vulnerable individuals. Uh, and that's really what modern day police training is about, uh, caring for the community, uh, whilst recognising how crime happens uh, and being ready to deal with it. Uh, whenever I speak to cohorts of uh, new police officers who've just completed their training, I, I make the point that they will, of course, in their career, deal with some villains and they'll deal with them accordingly. But the great majority of people will simply need their assistance uh, and that's how they have to work and to demonstrate empathy and understanding and compassion uh, to those people is very important and that's what we expect now from modern day policing. Okay, thank you both. Like I said, uh, Deke, one of the leaders from the Police Cadets, has just put his details in the chat. So, like I said before, anyone who's interested, uh, uh, please check out that information. Um, should we go to the next question? Um, yeah, so the, the question I have, it was a question of my own, um, and it, it's coming back to the whole drugs issue. Um, it's, it's an issue that I've campaigned on personally, um, and it's, a, it's an issue that is controversial, um, but I want to hear people's views on it. Um, so do you think legalizing a drug like cannabis um, would be beneficial uh, for the sake of perhaps reducing things like county lines um, and actually taking money away from drug gangs, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so I'm just curious to hear people's thoughts. I don't know about um, you, Commissioner, what your thoughts on that would be. Well, thank you. Since since you mentioned me specifically, I, I, I need to make a response, but I'm sure others will have views on that. Uh, I, I'm not in favour of decriminalising uh, cannabis, so-called soft drugs particularly. I, I'm not saying I, I would die in a ditch over it. No, uh, I'm prepared to listen to arguments, but it's not something that strikes me as a particularly good idea. In terms of drug dealers, um, they will move on to other harder drugs. In my opinion, uh, if they, if if uh, the the money that they generated from selling cannabis wasn't uh, wasn't sufficient, uh, and they drift into other forms of crime, um, so uh, I don't really see it as an advantage, except where there is clearly a medicinal case for it. Uh, and there I've got a degree of sympathy. Uh, I know that, for example, some people who are in considerable pain and discomfort, uh, whether it's arthritis, whether it's as a result of chemotherapy, and I've been there myself, uh, might get some relief. Uh, and therefore, where it can be prescribed for a very specific purpose, that's a different matter. But as a recreational drug, uh, I'm not really in favour of it, but others may have different views. And Pam's got a hand up, so if you want to come to you next. You'd, ex you'd expect me to have a, have a view on this. And, um, you know, this is based on, you know, those two and a half years as a special constable and 28 years in the police service. Um, and in the police service, I've been a negotiator, which is basically a either a hostage negotiator or a negotiator trying to save life. Uh, and what I would say is that the majority of times that I've been called out in the middle of the night to sometimes stop people from jumping off a bridge or committing harm to themselves, it's usually as a result of people taking taking drugs. And often as a use, um, a, a starting point has been under the influence of cannabis and or having taken can cannabis for a long time. And therefore it's had a huge impact on the way in which they, they think their, their cognitive behavior. Um, and, you know, one step leads to another. Um, and even people within my own family who I've seen, they, I've seen them go down a slippery slope. I've seen them go down a slippery slope. And so I am absolutely uh, with the commissioner on this. Um, you know, cannabis um, comes in lots of different strengths. So don't think you're just taking something that's that's not, not going to have an impact. 
cannabis has many different guises and can have a huge detrimental effect on brain, on your brain and on your behaviour. Okay, thank you so much for your answer. Is there anyone else who would like to answer this question before we move on? No? Okay, great. Um, we had a question in the chat um, for Kelly. Um, how can we facilitate uh, healthy sex education discussions in situations such as school? Um, it's a great question. It's a really, really good one. So I think because of time, I'll be very quick with my, my answer. But I think it's about creating a safe environment for young people because we're not generally quite comfortable talking about sex and sexual health as a society. It's something that people generally find a little bit embarrassing or it's something private. So therefore, we're not good at talking about it. So if we create a really good, safe environment, so I think having what we call like a group agreement so people know that they can talk freely you know that they feel safe having these conversations that young people understand what we mean by confidentiality so that yes as trusted adults you can definitely talk to us about these topics and we don't have to tell parents or carers however if you were to disclose something that made somebody believe you or another young person were at risk that wouldn't be something we could keep to ourselves so having really clear boundaries around what we talk about I think the other really important thing is making those spaces inclusive so that when we talk about relationships or we talk about sexual health we are being really inclusive to think of everybody in our society so that we are inclusive of LGBT plus people um, when we have these conversations. So again, everyone knows that actually it's for everyone. And I also think about is if you want to challenge something because people will come with their values and their views on different topics. It's not to make someone feel silly or not to make them feel bad for feeling a certain way or saying a certain word. It's about being able to challenge people positively to say, well, what makes you think that? Or why would you have used that word, you know, and maybe explaining why potentially those things might cause upset. So having very clear guidelines, being really fun make it interesting it doesn't need to be boring you know all of these topics hit everywhere for everyone you know so make it as enjoyable as possible and just so that young people can feel at ease talking about it and not feel silly for asking those questions and I can see that someone mentioned about why are there not more sexual health clinics for young people I get this question a lot okay sorry I hope chairs do not mind me kind of jumping onto that one that I could see um because in England, actually, Brooke have some sexual health clinics that we run for young people under 25. The closest one to kind of where Gwent is is actually in Bristol. But the challenge we have is that in England and Wales, because we have our own government, and we have our own Welsh Parliament, health services are paid for quite differently here in Wales. And you probably saw that a lot with COVID and rules for England, rules for Wales. But in Wales, our sexual health services are through your local health clinics. So your local hospital bases. The best thing I can recommend, and I put another link into the chat for you, is um, through Public Health Wales. They have a service where you can enter like your postcode as to, and on the NHS 111 website for Wales, where you live. And it will tell you where your nearest sexual health services are and what times they're open and how you can access them. But... Unfortunately, a lot of them are only open during school days and school times, which we know isn't great. So it's important to maybe know about the local um, uh, C card schemes that maybe are run through your local youth services or your local schools where you could get free contraception. But yeah, it's a challenge. And, and when you live in rural areas, and it gets even more challenging for people to access. So sorry, chairs, I hope you don't mind me taking the opportunity to jump on two questions there. Not at all. Um, does anyone quickly want to add to what Kelly has said? OK, great. I think you really covered quite a lot there, Kelly, so it's great hearing from you. <laughs> I think I think there's room to be a bit lenient, especially on such a, an important issue. I think it does need to be elaborated on sometimes. So, yeah, that's, yeah more Sorry. than happy with that. <laughs> OK, next question, Ben. Uh, yes, so um, the next question, uh, again, is from Kefili Youth Forum. And they would like to know what has been done throughout the police force um, to protect people, uh, predominantly women, 
from sexual assault, for example, like catcalling. Um, I think as a woman yourself, Pam, you may be best suited to answer this, especially as the chief constable as well. Um, so, yeah, if you'd like to start. Yeah, absolutely. A really good question. And of course, that violence against women and girls uh, is a really important agenda that we all, we're all talking about at the moment. But, you know, it starts it starts from society and perhaps some of our behaviours when we were in school, when we go, you know, go on to, to college and work and the like, um, and actually starts in people's homes as well in terms of how we perhaps think about society and behaviour that's acceptable. And, you know, when I joined the service, the police service, only 3% of, of police officers were women. And it was it was a horrible place to be. Um, you know, I enjoyed policing, but it was really difficult. Now, we're nearly 40, 42, 43 percent of women in police, uh, of police officers are, are female. And that's that's as it should be, uh, where women contribute to keeping society safe, but also having a view uh, and leadership roles in society as well. So how people behave in a society, in a community, on the street is really important. And it's linked a little bit to the antisocial behavior uh, commentary that I gave earlier. It's not acceptable. Don't be a bystander. Check and test each other's behaviors as peers because we have to nip any unhealthy dialogue, conversations, behavior in the bud. Otherwise, are we as a society going to go backwards and people start turning perhaps those verbal abuse, the wolf whistling and everything else that we mention, that sometimes builds and sometimes turns into hate and violence. And, you know, we have something like 13,000 domestic abuse cases um, in Gwent every year. And nearly 80% of those are crimes against women. Uh, so it's you know it's 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 absolutely unacceptable. So we need to be thinking about our behaviour as a society, and of course, policing and Gwent police, for me, will respond to any issues in relation to misogyny. Um, so that's hate against women, um, and of course, we want to have these conversations with people so that we make sure that society behaves in an acceptable way. And you are the future generations. You're the future people who can make this happen by working with us and by having these conversations. Thank you. It's very great to hear about all the stuff that you guys are doing to tackle these sort of issues. Um, would anyone else like to come in on this question? Just very quickly, if I could, um, and naturally I endorse what the Chief Constable has just said. We work very closely with the Welsh Government to have their own policy on violence against women and girls and domestic uh, abuse, and um, we're very, very pleased to do so uh, because it's it's a matter not just for policing, uh, but it's a matter for society at large. Um, it, and it does go back to something that Pam Kelly mentioned earlier, that about respect, uh, as, as well as uh, avoiding physical and mental abuse. Um, uh, we supported and have done so for many years, the White Ribbon Day uh, that's organised. Uh, there's a Welsh White Ribbon Day, it's an international event, but we will support the event that's uh, centred around the National Assembly, for example, the Senate, uh, and we will make it clear uh, uh, that uh, and our vehicles will bear the logo uh, of um, uh, White, White Ribbon Day. So it's something that's upfront for us. Uh, and it's critically important that men, whether they're police officers or in other walks of life, uh, acknowledge uh, that violence against women and girls is just totally unacceptable uh, and will do everything within their power to help prevent it. Okay, hey, thank you both. Um, is there anyone else who would like to answer that before you move on? Could I just add one thing in there, if you don't mind, just to make people aware, 
is that um, when we talk about peer-on-peer -peer kind of abuse and violence against each other, we know that in Wales that there is a bit of an issue around this. And our Estin, who do the inspections of schools, have recently done a report on it. And it's called Things We Don't Tell Our Teachers. And the things it really highlighted was actually how a lot of young people have really negative experiences around kind of sexual abuse, sexual assault, sexual harassment in school settings, which is obviously very, very unfortunate. But just to let you know that the Welsh Parliament, the Senate, their Children, Young People and Education Committee are currently doing a big inquiry into it because they're really concerned and they want to hear from young people as well as adults. But importantly, they want to hear from you as young people. And they've got a survey going on at the moment until the 1st of April. So again, I'm going to put another link in the chat. But just to say, it's your opportunity to have a say about these things so that when politicians are making decisions about these topics for you as young people in Wales this is a great way for you to be able to have a say as well so just pop it in but just to mention that I know it's an issue but there is a really good way that you can get involved and have a say um, on that issue as well thank you chairs and no problem thank you so much for your opinion as well it's great to see different people's perspectives from different areas of work as well um We've been asked in the chat um, for the people who work with the police, how do you stay mentally healthy doing the job that you do? Because obviously you come across some uh, maybe people consider disturbing crimes in your day to day work. How do you stay mentally healthy whilst in work? OK, so that's uh, that's one for me, I believe. So um, so we've got. Well, by next year, we'll have about 1,500 police officers in Gwent Police. And, and certainly, we'll have about 150 community support officers. Um, and, of course, we have police staff who work in our custody units and answer our 999 calls and 101 calls. And all of them probably deal with things that most people never see or, or need or need to get involved in. And they deal with that all of the time. And so one of my my priorities is well-being that's looking after our staff so we have an occupational health unit we try and build resilience so supporting people as part of their training in how to deal with trauma and then we have if you like well-being champions are people who go in and support people if they've dealt with something really difficult that day um, and that's called counseling trim counseling but you know i think whatever we do um, in life, it's really important that we equip ourselves with with tools that we can rely on. And so as a senior leader who, you know, is so privileged to work with all of these fantastic people who are making a difference every day, I can't look after them if I don't look after myself. So what I try and do is I try, first of all, to have a good sense of humour, because I think if you can have a laugh with your friends and that you can spend time with friends, whether, you know, just getting together, I saw some young people earlier having a giggle or even on I love it I think it's so important to have fun and about having fun and enjoying yourself and the next thing it's about listening to yourself and really understanding when perhaps you're struggling or having a bad day and let me tell you now every single one of us has a bad day sometimes every single one of us struggles at some point or another and then what do you do to to deal with that so it might be going for a walk. It might be talking about it. Um, and also what I've recently been doing is jumping on a, a, an exercise bike for half an hour every morning because, you know, a healthy body and a healthy mind is really important, especially when we all now spend so much time in front of a screen. But I think the best advice is kindness and compassion. I think if we're... all kind and compassionate to each other and we walk in each other's shoes now and again so when you know somebody's struggling I think that's the important thing make you happy that's the best yeah. hi hi Pam I'm just gonna come in if that's okay. give. 
into that with something difficult. Sorry, Pam. <laughs> Your connection's cutting in and out for us. I don't know whether it's the case for everyone else in the meeting, but we didn't quite catch exactly what you said. Um, if you had any points that you would want to cover, can you please put them in the chat just so the young people who wanted to know the answer to our question could have that clearly? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, if I, can if I could just add, uh, Pam's yeah. absolutely right. We need to remember that police officers, no matter how highly trained, are human beings. Uh, and they will have the same emotions as anyone else. Um, and police officers can be confronted with some terrible situations. Uh, yesterday in the news, it was mentioned that two people from Penral in Kafili are being charged uh, in relation to ownership of the dangerous dog that killed a in Penral. Um, towards the end of last year. You may remember it, it was uh, quite a um, sensational case for all the wrong reasons. When the police officers turned up to that, they not only had to deal with a very dangerous and large and powerful dog, they saw the gun, uh, terrible injuries it had inflicted on that child, and of course the child died, uh, as we know. That sort of thing will stay with anybody for a long period of time, and that will include police officers. We also had the case, uh, and it's very important to recognise uh, that people need support. We also had the case where police officers from Gwent were awarded for, uh, received an award for bravery last year. You, you may also have heard uh, of that in, in Monmouthshire. Um, a water buffalo that had been kept on a farm had attacked and killed one person but the police officers brought it under control. A different type of situation, but the danger to them, their life and limb, was perhaps just as bad as being faced with a very dangerous and large dog. Um, in fact, probably more so, uh, given the size of the beast. So it's, it's, it's a job that, probably more so than any other, that at the beginning of your shift, you don't know what's coming up. Uh, it may be perfectly straightforward, but it may be difficult, uh, and we have to recognise that, reward it when it when it when it happens. But at the same time, make sure that we're ready there with support, um, both emotional and physical. Thank you so much, both. Yeah, thank you. Um, I saw your message, um, Pam. I, I think it was yourself asking if we could hear your answer. I think we got the majority of it, so I just wanted to reassure you there. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask is, um, it, it's a question that came in through the chat. Um, so for those mental health professionals on the meeting, I guess, um, what would you say is the most important part of mental health support? Um, is it about giving help to those who need it or educating those around the people who need help um, in ways they can help whoever are close to the person with mental health struggles? OK, um, Rebecca, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you very <laughs> much. Um, I think, to be honest, it's a bit of both because not one person or not one team or not one professional can do everything. And also there's sometimes where you might want someone that you know really well to help you, not someone that's a stranger. So I think it's about having the support there, but also helping other people who know you best, so school teachers or um, youth workers, to also help you. So I think it's an absolute combination of both would be my sense. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, can we move on to Kibifa as well? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So I completely agree with Rebecca. So we, when we see children and young people with a difficulty, we always say, think child, think family, think system around them. So there might be multiple ways of addressing. Sometimes it may be work just with the young person, but uh, quite rightly so, the environment and the social factors plays such an important role. So like the, whoever is closest to the young person also needs to know how to help and support them. So the system around the child is equally important. So it's not either or, but it's both and. Thank you so much both. And um, would anyone else like to come in on that question? 
Okay, no, great. Thank you. You both covered that really well. Um, I've got a question from the chat as well. Um, how many police stations are safe haven spots? Um, could maybe one of Pam or Jeff answer that question, please? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? I didn't quite catch it. Of course. Uh, how many police stations are safe haven spots in Gwent? Uh, what? Sorry? Sa safe haven spots. Oh, oh, right. Well, I right. Gosh, you, you caught me a bit here. I may have to defer to uh, the chief constable to answer that. I would hope they all are um, in their sense. If, if you mean um, accessible, um, that's that's uh, physically um, that's uh, not quite the same thing. But um, I think it's probably best on this that um, I, I ask uh, the chief constable to comment. Thank you. So so first of all, um, every single police station, every single police officer is someone that people can go to to be to ask for safety. Um, and even if there isn't a front counter desk, um, you know, where people can actually go in and, uh, and make inquiries. There's a little yellow phone that people can use to ask and it goes straight through to our control room. And Or there's a button that people can press in an emergency. Um, so every single officer, community support officer uh, and station is, is a point of safety for anyone who needs it in Gwent, anyone. And of course, where in terms of safe havens, some places, you know, such as a coffee shop and other areas are sometimes designated as safe haven places uh, for people to go to. Um, uh, and of course, you know, m most schools are a safe haven place and the like. But just from a Gwent police perspective, if anyone needs to be safe, they can go to any police station, any police officer, any community support officer at any time. Thank you so much both. Um, you want to ask that question? Yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. So we've had another um, question in from the chat. Um, so a young person would like to know how can um, a young person from a BAME background, Black, Asian or minority ethnic background um, know if they have been a victim of hate crime? Um, how would they be able to tell the difference? Look, it's if I just start on this, um, and I'm sure Pam wants to come in as well. In a sense, it's in the eye of the beholder. If that person, whatever their background or whatever their protected characteristics are, if they feel that they're being abused or threatened or feel frightened, and it's because of their difference from the other person, then that may be a hate crime. It might not actually be a crime, but it's certainly a hate incident um, at least. Uh, so really, if they feel that they are being picked on, uh, selected for special treatment because of their difference to the other person, uh, then that is something that they should report. Uh, and we I won't go through the reporting arrangement. We, we've discussed this earlier, but it's very much about how the recipient of, of that um, comment or abuse feels about it. OK, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, can we pass over to pa Pam now, please? Thank you. So many of you would have seen the Welsh Government's announcement on wanting to become a, an anti-racist Wales. Um, and, and that is absolutely right and proper that we do everything that we can um, as citizens and organisations to be an anti-racist Wales. And Gwen Police is absolutely striving to become an anti-racist organisation. Um, but what that means is that we've got to challenge each other challenge the organisation um, around something called bias and often unconscious bias that is used. And, and so that's really important, it's healthy challenge. So I'm constantly linking in with black and Asian and minority ethnic members of our community and asking for advice so that we check and test what we're doing. Now, of course, some members of our community are suspicious or don't have confidence in policing. 
And generally, some of our black and Asian colleagues don't have confidence in policing. And I'm trying to do everything I can to reduce that gap by recruiting people from BME backgrounds to come into policing, to challenge us and to help us build bridges with communities that perhaps are a little bit concerned about us. But as and, and if you know, please help us on that. So to be an anti-racist Wales, we need people to speak out. So if people feel that they're being targeted or the behaviour is unacceptable, it's all about having those go to people again, your teachers, your friends, your family or a police officer, somebody in education that you can go to and say, I don't like this. And I do it all the time because I want Wales to be the best it can be. And I, without question, want Gwent to be the best it can be so that you and your children and your futures live in an anti-racist Wales where we all feel comfortable and confident that we're checking and testing each other. So absolutely speak out about it and talk about it and approach the people who care. Thank you so much both. Um, to stay on that kind of topic, um, do you feel that there is enough funding um, available for the Gwent Police to be able to tackle such issues, um, you know, priority issues around Gwent? Uh, look, I, I'll start with that one because the funding of uh, Gwent Police is very much a commissioner's responsibility. Um, funding comes from two sources, central government, that is the UK government, not the Welsh government, policing is not devolved, uh, and then from the local council taxpayers of Gwent, which is called the policing precept. And roughly they're equal, it's roughly 50-50. Um, about £150 million pounds, uh, is, uh, per annum is the Gwent uh, budget in that, that order, which is a lot of money. It sounds a lot of money, but when you consider that's got to pay for all the salaries, of police officers and staff uh, and to make sure we've got enough vehicles that we've got decent premises and that they're all kept up to date and that we get other equipment like body worn video and of course the IT systems that we depend on more and more now it doesn't um, last all, all that long so it's all we can always use more money um, but I think in terms of this specific issue uh, um, it is it is a priority for us um, and I hope we've made that clear during the, the the youth question time sessions so far. So yes, I do think we, we are able to devote sufficient monies to it. But if your question to me is, could we use more money? My answer is most definitely yes. OK, thanks so much. Um, Pam, did you want to add anything to that? I didn't mean to have my hand up, but no, I agree with the commissioner. Um, but the reality is dealing with um, with hate crime will always be a priority. If we didn't have any money at all and we only had volunteer police officers, this would be a priority for us because it's so important for our communities. OK, thank you so much. Um, we've had another question into the chat. Um, how can young people going through situations such as parent divorce or other family conflicts deal with that and stay on top of their mental health during such difficult times? Uh, who would like to answer that question? Rachel, do you want to start us off? Hi, um, yeah, just to say how hard that is and, um, you know, real courage and bravery to put that in the chat so really appreciate that question and what that's you know taken um to be vulnerable to share that so um thank you for that and um you know i think it, it's such a big thing when your parents divorce no matter how it's um managed and you know there's kind of times that that's managed better than other times but and everybody's different again so whether you've got support of siblings or other people other friends that have gone through having parents that have divorced but I think you know it comes down to we can only be resilient in response to relationships so you kind of you know growing up you know your 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 capacity to manage things um 
you know in stressful times depends on the relationships that you've got at the time and like I said before it's not an even you know level playing field everybody has a different level of access to parent support and I saw that in the chat too and when sometimes some you know it doesn't feel like your parents have got your back or it's not working out or whatever may be and that's so hard when things at home are difficult um but I think it is turning to those people that you do trust and and talking to them I think staying on top of your mental health I mean it's a challenge for all of us all the time to work out um, what things are going to feel stressful or not and depending on the people that we are you know putting on music and having a dance could feel completely and utterly overwhelming and overstimulating or might feel quite helpful but it's whatever the little things are that will make a difference to you and trying to get the people that love and care for you around you to understand how difficult this time is and try and get them involved in supporting you because that's what we all want isn't it we want to be there for people that we love and care for and we want them to be there for for us and they will want to be there for you too um yeah it's not a kind of obvious answer but I think it's so hard to give a kind of uh you know recipe to follow in these situations thank you so much Rachel um if we pass on to Kafifa now thank you I agree with Rachel the additional point I wanted to add is decisions that are taken by adults obviously there will be impact on children young people but the reassuring message is that um children and young people very often that we see feel very much responsible and feel guilty. Um, however, the main thing is you can only do what you can do, but people making those decisions, some of those are beyond your control. So I think at the end of the day, like how to cope with stress, all of those are really important. Keeping connections, keeping that self-care um, and dealing with some of those uncertainties that adults are dealing with and um, thinking about the difficulties they may be going through. But at the end of it, um, just you, for you to feel that you, you are not in charge, you are not in control and you're not responsible will be a good way of keeping yourself um, uh, sane and be in control when things are out of control. That's uh, really important. And all the things that we have discussed about how to cope when things are really difficult would be something to think about because that's a very stressful time for any child or young person. Thank you so much. I'm going to join ask last question. Yes, I will, whilst my eyesight is still intact. <laughs> um, so not only do we need to help um, young people through uh, specific things like youth clubs, youth forums, um, how are we helping them if they are underprivileged and unable to attend these certain clubs and also how are we um, making other people such as the elderly um, feel safe and included within their community i don't know who wants to come in on that yeah well <laughs> let me just quickly say uh, and it's uh, it's been put in the chat by my uh, deputy uh, police and crime commissioner Larry Thomas that we do fund a range of projects and activities uh, for young people and particularly young people who are um, uh, financially disadvantaged. They're from disadvantaged communities uh, who could be in danger of slipping into the criminal justice system if they're not given more positive. Uh, activities to do. Uh, last week, last week I, I visited a number of them uh, and together with the High Sheriff we awarded funds to organisations that are doing exactly the sort of thing that I've just been referring to. We also fund uh, intergenerational work uh, communities that are working to bring young people and older people together so they can support each other and that's very very important and certainly aids understanding. So the, the issue of commissioning services like that and paying for it um, is something that we're very keen to continue with. OK, thank you so much, Jeff. If we pass on to Pam, please. Thank you, chairs. Two chairs there. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and you know, I when I was in school, I um, my mum was a single parent and my mum and I had free dinners. And it was really difficult because my mum didn't have a lot of money for me to go to youth clubs and everything else. Um, but 
there were some really good things happening in the community that I could join, you know, and I and I managed to do a lot of that, whether it be sport and youth clubs and the like. So try and go along because and don't be afraid to ask if you need some help um, because perhaps you haven't got enough money in your family to help out because that's what I had to do. Uh, and I was then able to access lots of different things um, that allowed me to think to, to engage with lots of people that perhaps I wouldn't have if I hadn't gone along to those events. But of what we do in In Gwent Police is, of course, we've um, invested in next generation officers and Deke, who's online with us tonight, is one of them. And those next generation officers are all about building bridges with everyone absolutely everyone who is young and wants to get involved and also the question around elderly people um i really feel for elderly people who might be you know living on their own not be able to get out and about and there's a lovely lovely thing called frindy me uh, which is all about friendship and some of our police cadets have been involved with frindy me which has been perhaps you know hosting a coffee morning or going and uh, having a chat with with people um, who perhaps may be living on their own and feel a little bit isolated it's everyone's responsibility and policing hopefully is is trying to do that that little bit as well we are here to lock people up who to commit crime but we're actually here because we're a part of the community as well and that's what's important for people to see Okay, thank you so much both. Um, we're going to move on to the final question of the evening. Um, are there enough provisions for young people around mental health and is there an ability to access these services quickly enough? Um, if we can go to uh, Becky first. Um, I think to be honest, thank you Eva, I think to be honest in terms of the kind of crisis thing, I wonder whether Kavitha might be more well placed to, to answer that question, if that's okay, if I can hand it over. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah thanks, um, Rebecca. I think we we are making all efforts to uh, see young people as early as possible, as quickly as possible. We do have um, uh, young people who need urgent care. So like I said, um, emergency services are available. So we do have access through our front door services via, via the general practitioner, the GP or uh, accident and emergency. So we have our liaison team working quite closely with a lot of mental health services, um, with a lot of services outside of mental health. Um, and um, so so going back to the question of how what services are there that can provide urgent care, depending on the need, we have broadened our front door. So when we talk about a single point of access, I don't know if uh, young people may or may not be aware, uh, all of us between health, education and social care, along with volunteer organizations are working together to understand the need and to see who is the right service, who is the right person that can that has good knowledge of the young person that already knows what their difficulties are and already is there to support and our crisis teams work very closely. So anyone in crisis will get a response within 24 hours, irrespective of it is a weekday or a weekend. And like I said, it is not just one person or one service. We work collaboratively with a lot of our partners. So especially and Rachel may help to talk about children who specifically are looked after or in care. We do have my support team. We do have, again, uh, lots of connections with people who already are in residential homes and children's homes. So working with staff who are already working with the ch child and young person. So we, uh, yeah, we are available and accessible uh, direct work for some indirectly through people who are already involved. OK, thank you so much. If we can quickly pass on to Rachel before we close for the evening. I'm just noticing my light is getting darker <laughs> as the time is going, so I hope you can still see me. Um, I was just going to say, like Vita said, a lot of what we do these days, a bit more kind of updated um, way of working, I guess, is that we work in partnership with other organisations. And um, that's because we recognise that, you know, trying to get involved early in young people's lives and to try and shift things in a preventative way is really important. Um, and in the past, you could get to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or other health professionals that are, you know, linked to mental health and well-being um, after a GP 
GP referral and further down the line. And so what we're trying to do is, um, so the service that I work for, we work with um, sports and development teams. Um, some of the youth services that may be even on here may work with some of my colleagues. Um, and it's about supporting um, those people that have those trusted relationships with young people to feel themselves supported to do that work. And um, yeah, and sometimes then there's a possibility to do some direct work with young people in that way. But it's, you know, there's so many services like Kavitha mentioned, um, missed um, my space now, um, sorry, and um, Gwent Attachment Service, whole school approach. There's loads of different psychology um, groups and other professional groups that are working to try and make sure that in Gwent, young people have access, you know, at the right time as early as possible um, to um, support around mental health and well-being. Thank you so much to our panel. Um, I'm going to pass over to Bronwyn to close in Welsh and then we'll close in English. So if I hand over to you, Bronwyn, to close. Yeah, so diolch mawr i chi gyd am eich gwestiynau ac i'r panel am Amina a ni pren hawn ma. Um, roedd yn clywed hyfryd a wych i clywed gwestiynau mor am rhywiol am nifer o faterion pwysig iawn. Um, Peidiwch ag anghofio bod y sesiwn wedi cael ei recordio a bydd ar gael ar sianel YouTube sydd fe comisiynydd yr heddlu a throsedd. A bydd recordio goledol o'r sesiwn heno yn cael ei enfon at pawb. Well done, I'll do it. Um, a digwyddiad Harry Holly Yank to Gwent Hun. Um, Gobethia ich bochi wedi mwyn her session. Um, Redim and Gobethia ich gwelchi and a canaud vloed in Nesav. Also, the key wedi kalich a faith yog and in Ruraya or Materion, Agodoid Hedu. My genum ni waithwer yank did a be than Aros our lane, ne shaladuch ach athro, ne ruin redchin and viriad and the new. Um, Kovyuk will hire Holly Adir Arlene, see Anna Bulch's Gursia Hevid. Um, not so like that, good evening. Uh, thank you so much, Bowman, for your watch tonight. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending for your questions, and thanks, everyone, on the panel. Um, it's great to hear such a wide variety of questions around a number of really important issues Did to you. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, if you're having issues with the survey, we'll try and sort that out. Um, don't forget that the session has been recording, uh, recorded and will be available on the Office for the Police and Crime Commissioner YouTube channel. And if the and uh, video recording of tonight's session will be sent out to everyone attending. Um, that's it from us on the Gwent Youth Question Time event. We hope that you've enjoyed the session. Next year, we hope to see you all in person. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised today, we have youth workers who will be staying online. So or please talk to your teacher or someone that you trust. Please can I remind you that it will take just a few minutes to fill on the online survey, which is in the chat box, if we can get our work in. Yes. OK, and if, we, if not, we'll send it out to um, everyone on their emails if you can't access that right now. Um, if you want to fill out that survey, if you want to put out your email address in the chat, then we can send that survey to you. And if you can't access that right now, not with that. And um, good evening to everyone. Thanks so much for attending again, guys. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Excellent evening. Excuse me, I have a question. Yes, see what's your question? It's not let me go to the website. I've went to the website and it's not taking me and it's no link to get further. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna put it into the chat and also if you can't access it, you'll be sent. Yeah, it an email. says I've I pressed and it took me to the website and it's uh, and it's no link and it's I've clicked everywhere and it can't and there's no way how we connect. Oh, um, yeah, we're going to send it to you in the WhatsApp group for you for everyone else. Yeah, it's, it's, it's only, it's only, oh, hang on, I forgot there's a scroller bar there. Didn't realise there's a scroller bar there. Okay, um, I hope there's no more issues with the survey. Um, if there are, guys, we should be sending that to your emails. So thank you, everyone, again, for attending. Yeah. Oh, goodbye, I didn't realise there's a scroll bar there. So I That's the right. We all have moments like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Rian, no. Rian, didn't realise there's a scroll bar there, so thank you.